Good morning, church. We are so glad that you're here with us today in worship digitally. We welcome you, and we want you to welcome each other. So during this opening music, would you take the time to just type in a hello, um, to say hello to your friends, to tell us who you're worshiping with, uh, where you're joining us from? We would just love to form this digital community. And if you're watching on YouTube, just leave a little comment. Then the people who come after you can know that community too. We're so glad that you're here with us today. We pray the Holy Spirit would speak to your heart, would encourage you, and you would leave filled up and knowing that God loves you. Let us join together this morning in our call to worship from Psalm 25. In you, Lord my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. Guard my life and rescue me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me, because my hope, Lord, is in you.
Hi, kids. It is so wonderful to be worshiping with you all today. Have you ever been the line leader at school or the first to get to open Christmas presents at home or the best player on the team? Being number one, the leader, the first and best, is a really great feeling. But Jesus kind of turned that first is best thing upside down. He was always doing that, turning things upside down and toward God's kingdom. You see, he taught that a leader is a person who puts the needs of others before the needs of their own. And that in God's kingdom, the last will be first and the first will be last. Listen to the story. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were two of Jesus' twelve disciples, two of his best friends. One day they went with their mother to see Jesus. It says in the Bible that their mom knelt before him. And then she asked Jesus if he could do this one favor for them. Jesus said, what do you want? She went on to ask him if in his kingdom, one of her sons could be right next to him on his right side, and the other could be right next to him on his left side. That would make them feel so special and important to get to sit right beside Jesus. Well, Jesus told her that she did not know what she was asking. You see, pretty soon he was going to have to suffer a lot. And anyway, Jesus reminded them that God is the one who knows the plans for them in his kingdom. 
When the other disciples heard all of this, they were mad at James and John for just trying to get the number one best seats beside Jesus. So Jesus went on to tell them that in his kingdom, God's kingdom, people put others first. The greatest are the ones who serve others, who help and care and put others as more important than themselves. Just as he came to give his life as a servant for the whole world. You see, serving is what God's kingdom is about. And when we find ways to do that, we are helping to bring God's kingdom here and now. Serving is caring for God's creatures. Serving is feeding others, and you can help to do that in your very own home. Serving is helping your family with chores around the house. Serving is finding ways to cheer people up, like making special cupcakes just for them. Serving is showing people you love them by spending time with them, like reading a book to your little brother. Find ways to be a servant right in your own home this week with your family. That will make you great in Jesus' eyes. And God will bless you. Stay safe, and I'll see you soon. Church, let us join our hearts and minds together in prayer as we lift our cares, our concerns, and our thanks to our God. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this time that we can gather together, even though we're not in the same place. You have brought us together as a family. You make us one because of who you are, not because of where we are. We thank you for your grace, your love that has filled our lives, for the gifts of, of joy and peace in the midst of the storms around us. We thank you, God, that even though we may not be able to trust in a lot of things around us, in you we can always put our trust. Lord, we lay before you this day all of the concerns of our lives, concerns about jobs and concerns about finances, concerns about our family members. Some are close and some are far away. We place all of these things in your hands because we know that you care for us. Lord, we thank you for being with us, for walking with us through those times when we felt so alone. Your word tells us that you never leave us or forsake us. So thank you for always being with us. Lord, we thank you for strengthening us when we feel like we can't take another step. You are there to help us take that step. And then, Lord, when it's time for us to rest, you help us to rest. Lord, there's so much to be thankful for. All that you have given to us, all that you do for us, and who you are for us. For the gifts of your church, for the gift of your word, for the gift of your spirit, Lord, thank you for all of these things. As we strive to live out the faith, Lord, we place ourselves and our congregation in your hands, and we look forward to the good that you will bring to us and through us as we reach out to those in need around us. Thank you, God, for hearing our prayers this day and every day. We lift them to you in the name of Christ. Amen. Church, we've come to the point in our worship where we get to give back to the Lord. It's just a little bit of the abundance that God pours into our lives. And I want you to know how much your giving changes lives, how much good your giving does. We've had Vacation Bible School, and we're reaching out to youth, and we're expanding our food ministry, all of this during a pandemic, because this is when hurting people need us, perhaps more than they ever have in our city and in this congregation. So thank you for your generosity. Thank you for your giving. Um, as you know, you can give digitally, you can give online, you can mail in a check. We have a secure drop box. If you're having any problems at all, just give us a call at the church office and we'd be happy to help you. And once again, just thank you for everything you're doing at such a hard time in our community to give back. It makes a huge difference. You 
have faced the mountain of desperation. You have climbed, you have fought, you have won. But this valley that lies coldly before you cast a shadow you cannot overcome. And just when you think you had it all together, you knew every verse to get you through. But this time all the sorrow broke more than just your heart, and reciting all those verses just won't do. When answers aren't enough, there is Jesus. He is more than just an answer to your prayer. And your heart will find a safe and peaceful refuge. When answers aren't enough, he is there. Instead of asking why did it happen, think of where it could lead you from here. And as your pain is slowly easing, you find a greater reason to live your life triumphant through the tears. When answers aren't enough, there is Jesus. He is more than just an answer to your prayer. Your heart will find a safe and peaceful refuge when answers aren't enough. He is there. He is there. When answers aren't enough, there is Jesus. He is more than just an When answers aren't enough, when answers aren't enough, when answers aren't enough, he is there. Oh, friends, what a week it's been for us. As our community is on national news making headlines in ways that none of us ever wanted, and we're going back to sheltering in place again, and I know that we're all just so tired and so weary and ready for this to be over, but we can't see the end in sight. So I thought before we began the message today, we would just pray for our community, and I pray for each of you, and you would just, just receive this as a blessing. So let's, let's pray. God, I pray that you would be with our community. I pray with, that you would be with our weary first responders, all those doctors and nurses and techs and everybody at the hospital um, who has to put one foot in front of the next day after day and help them to have your strength when theirs is failing. Help them to have your hope on the hard days. We pray that you would be with them, that you would be with each of the people who are sick to bring your healing as they're alone, to bring your comfort 
as they're isolated to just assuage their loneliness. And Lord, we pray for our community. I pray for each member here that you would be with us as we do what we can to stop the spread of COVID-19. That you be with us as we are tired and we're afraid and we're worn down by this to help us keep going and to help us even in this time as it gets darker and darker to let your light shine through us to the people around us. Help us to do that, Lord. Give us hope when we need hope and give us strength for the day. And help us, Lord, with your amazing power and your amazing healing to bring us through to the other side. May our community not be destroyed by this, but be made stronger. May we come out um, just better on the other side, not because of this horrible thing, but because of the good that you will bring out of it, which is your promise to us, that you cause all things to work for good when we love you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, friends, our scripture today is from Matthew chapter 20. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers, which is James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So friends, I wanted to tell you about something that I just hated as a child. The thing that really got me when I was a kid, the thing that I didn't look forward to, that I really resisted and railed against, having to sit in the middle seat. The indignity. My mother knew about safety long before the other mothers had caught on. While kids were rolling around in the back of hatchbacks and in the front seat without seat belts, we were properly buckled, all three of us, across the back seat, and none were permitted in the front seat because that was too dangerous. Mom knew it, which meant one of us was stuck in that non-seat we call the middle. No view, brother and sister on each side, or if it was my little brother, it was two sisters on each side. It was just terrible, that little hump where you couldn't even have the leg room that everybody else had. So I, being the oldest, said, I'm the oldest, and my legs are the longest, and so I don't fit well here. It was mostly true. I was the tallest, and my legs fit the worst. But my brother and sister had their reasons, too. Like, my sister, she got car sick. So she would say, I need to sit in the window seat so that I don't get sick. And my brother, he just leaned into his skills as the younger brother. He, if he was in the middle, he would annoy both me and my sister, and that would infuriate my mother. And so finally, at her wit's end, I'm sure, she, being an accountant, made us a schedule. We were on a schedule of when we would have to sit in the middle seat, and it was pinned to our refrigerator with a magnet. And every time I saw my day coming up, I just got a little bit more angry, a little bit more. Um, the world got dark in my eyes because I hated the middle seat. Now, as I grew up, I began to see the graciousness of sitting in the middle so that others could have the, the good seats. And if my brother and sister and I are ever traveling these days and we're in tight quarters and somebody has to go in the middle, then one of us will magnanimously say, in fact, all of us will say, I'll sit in the middle or we'll just go sit in the middle. And then the other person will say, oh, I was going to do that because we're trying to be kind and considerate to each other. And so what I thought as I went from child to adult is I have outgrown those selfish ways. I've put it behind me, right? I'm such a more giving and a generous person these days. And then I had to start flying around for business on airplanes. And I realized that even as adults, we still hate the middle seat. Do anything to not sit there. Book far in advance, pay the extra fee on Southwest, 
whatever it is, just so that we don't get stuck in that abysmal seat. And I will never forget, never forget that was 10 years ago, the time that all my best laid plans just fell to dust in my hand. Because my, I had two flights, and the first flight had problems and was delayed. Now, I was holding, friends, an A boarding pass because I had booked in advance, and as soon as that window on Southwest opened, I was there to get my boarding pass and get in the A group and not have to deal with this insanity. So I was sitting on my first flight in the, in the aisle seat, right? And I popped up, and I was ready to go and ready to grab my bag, and I was just waiting, just biting my nails and trying to think, am I going to have enough time to sprint to my connecting flight? Will I make it? Will I be stuck here at this airport? And so I'm just watching the passengers deplane and waiting and waiting, and finally it's me, and I grab my little suitcase, and I rush out, and I'm just dodging in between people in the terminal, and I'm sprinting, and I'm pulling my little luggage behind me, and I'm checking the boards to make sure I know where, where the connecting flight is. I sprint to that gate. I make it. I am the last person on the plane. They scan my A boarding pass. They let me on. They close the door behind me. And I'm like, this is great. This is great. I'm going to make it home. And then there was this little voice in my head that said, how great is it exactly? Because how full is this flight going to be? Oh my gosh. Then I had a whole nother thing to worry about. Like, how full is this flight going to be? Will they, I have an A boarding pass, but suddenly it's worthless. And okay, I thought, you know, you, you know what? It's probably totally fine. And the flight is totally empty. And I can still sit in, a, in an aisle or a window. I take that. Or maybe they'll move one of those C boarding pass people. I get on the flight. I look. Every seat is taken. Every seat except for the second row in the middle. Second row in the middle. Get there and squeeze into the stupid middle seat, stupid middle seat. I try to get my bag into that stupid space in front of the middle seat that's too small, it's smaller than the window in the aisle. I sit there and I buckle my seatbelt. I'm like, fine, I'm gonna wrestle for the armrest, the whole flight. You know, this is what it's going to be like. Oh, the indignity. And it <laughs> kind of irked me even more because I thought, let's just get this over with. Let's just get this middle seat over with and get me home and I'll get out and I'll go drive my own car, right? And as I'm in this utter sulk, I realize we're not pushing back from the gate. We are, I was the last person. They closed the door behind me. We should be pushing back. We should be going. But instead, I see that the captain, the co-pilot, all the flight attendants are up at the front by the front bathroom talking to an older man, and we're not taking off. And so I was in a bad place. I'm thinking, what is this guy's deal? You know, is he having a problem? I have mercy for that. Like, is it a problem? It, it, there's no seats left. Um, what's going on? But everyone at the front, the pilots and, and the flight attendants, seem real jovial and real friendly and like it doesn't matter at all if we delay this flight further as long as we get to talk to this guy. And so they're, they're having this conversation and I'm trying to figure out who is this guy. He's not, he's not just an ordinary passenger with a problem. I've finally decided maybe he's a pilot. You know, he's a pilot on a connecting flight. And then I started thinking, wait a minute, if he's a pilot, did he give up his seat? Oh my gosh, did he give up his seat so that I could sit here because I was late? That makes, that makes it seem different. And sure enough, as they get ready to take off, I'm looking for where he's gonna sit, he buckles in to a jump seat with the rest of the flight attendants. So I'm like, oh, he's a pilot, and this was his seat. Well, then the cra this crazy thing happens. We take off. That was fine, which is what you want. And you know that 
period of time where the flight attendants get up, but the passengers have to stay seated. We're in that period of time, but the guy in the jump seat, who I thought was a pilot, he gets up. And as the flight attendants move down the aisle of the plane, he follows them and he makes eye contact with every single one of us on both sides. And he's saying, thank you for flying Southwest. We sure do appreciate you. Our customers are the best. Thank you so much. Who is this guy who's thanking me for flying Southwest? And so I broke the barrier, you know, between aisle and window. And I just said, hey, uh, do you know who that guy was? Who's that guy? They had no clue. But the two businessmen in the front row, a boarding pass in front of me, they turn and they peek through that little crack in the seats. And I can just see like one eye and a nose. And they're like, hey, do you want to know who that is? Yeah, we, we all do now. They said, that's Herb Kelleher. Herb Kelleher. You know, the, the founder of Southwest, the, the former CEO, he's the chairman of the board. That guy's amazing. And they turn around. Like, we're going to get caught out talking about Herb Kelleher. He's going to walk up, back up. And he does walk back up. I'm thinking, wow, the, the chairman of the board, the founder of this company, the creator and the innovator who created the Southwest culture, um, that's this guy. That guy maybe like gave up his seat. And then somebody else was like, ooh, huh, probably that guy. Took the aisle. Then the flight attendants start to serve the peanuts. But Herb Kelleher takes the basket from them and begins to serve every passenger peanuts. Chairman of the board, one who kept the company vibrant and vital during the Great Recession, that guy served me and everybody else peanuts. That guy gave up his seat, maybe. And I'm sitting there looking at my pack of peanuts, and it's like God's shown a spotlight on the state of my soul. And God said to me, Laura, do you want to know what leadership is? That's leadership. That man who sat in a jump seat and who took the lowest job in the company that's what Jesus was talking about. When he talked about servant leadership, it's that. It's taking the middle seat, right? Or the jump seat, the worst seat instead of the best. It's like God said, that's what I want you to be. You have a ways to go. And what amazed me about this, y'all, as I sat there and God worked in my heart, is I thought, Herb Kelleher is not doing this as some publicity stunt. He wasn't doing it to impress the passengers. He wasn't even wearing a name tag. He wasn't wearing anything that would let us know that he was the most important person in the company. He wasn't being followed by a news crew or camera crew. Oh, look at Herb Kelleher. He's taking the lowest job in the company. What a great man. He just served. He just served. That was who he was. And it gave me this visual model of what Jesus was talking about. Because remember, Jesus was always talking about how his children would be known for our service. Service to others. Service to outsiders. Service to each other. Right? That the greatest in God's kingdom wouldn't be the ones with the best seats. It would be the ones who choose the worst seat. That leadership for Jesus is taking the middle seat. And so think about how in his day, there were all these people with A boarding cards, right? And they're like, this is the circle of the people who have the A boarding passes, right? And you're B or C. And so, you know, you're less than us. And Jesus kept breaking all of those walls apart and saying, no, it's really everybody. It's those Samaritans 
and it's the sick, and it's the people who have made an utter mess of their lives. They can come, and the kids can come. And every wall that somebody tried to put up and say, no, it's us, Jesus would say, no, it's everybody. And the first thing that we have to do is we have to confront the selfishness in our own hearts. We have to realize that even to this day, uh, this is where we want to be. The best seat. That we think about ourselves, we think about those we love, we want to get the best for the people we care about and for ourselves. And y'all, that's a really ugly reality to have to come face to face with in yourself. None of us like to be considered selfish. But until we confront our selfishness, and listen, we have a lot of very sophisticated reasons, justifications. Like I can say, well, you know, I logged on earlier than these other people, or I planned better than this person. Um, So I have an A pass, and you have a C, better luck next time, but this time I get to be treated like A. But isn't it just the, the same childish selfishness with fancier justifications? And until we confront our selfishness, that sinfulness, we're not ever going to be able to let Jesus stand us up and change us. Because Jesus would have us take the middle seat. And so how do we do that? How how is Jesus going to change us, going to help us get rid of our selfishness and transform it to selflessness. Well, let's look at how he did that for the disciples. I am so encouraged that the disciples struggled with this too, okay? They spent three years face-to-face with Jesus, day and night, every miracle, every teaching. They were there, and they still had a hard time with this. They took a step forward, and then there was a couple steps back, and then a couple steps forward, right? They're, they're saying one, one moment, they're like, okay, this is great, and everyone's getting fed. And the next moment, they're like, no, not the kids. I mean, Jesus doesn't have time for those kids, only adults. Or, you know, let's call fire from heaven on those Samaritans because they're not, they're not reacting the way we thought they would. <laughs> Jesus is always helping them see, no, it's really everyone that can be taught everyone that can come close, everyone that can be fed, right? Everyone. Take the middle seat. And the best example of their uh, selfishness comes as Jesus is heading towards Jerusalem for the last time. And he's told the disciples that he's going there because he's going to give his life. He's going to give his life in exchange for ours. It's going to atone for our sins, right? He's going to take our place. He's going to die. And they have a hard time hearing that. So what they translate it to in their minds is now is the time for victory, right? He's about to win, and there's going to be a throne. And so if there's going to be a throne, there's going to be something on the left and something on the right. And everybody wanted the seat on the left and the seat on the right of Jesus when he's in victory, right? So James and John, right before the scripture we read this morning, they approach Jesus on the road and they're like, Jesus, um, we want you to say yes, and then we'll tell you what you just said yes to. And Jesus says, "Uh, what is it? And they said, um, you know, when you are on the throne, we want the left and the right-hand side. Us, because we're awesome. And what they're doing is they're like, give us the A and put the rest of the disciples in B or C. Or D. Who cares? Because who cares about them? And Jesus seeing this problem and knowing that his time is so short then uses his last meal to tell them yet again that the posture of leadership in God's kingdom is the middle seat, not a throne. And so while he's sitting down for the Passover meal, they would have given him the best spot because he's the Messiah. He's God's son incarnate. He's their leader. He sits at the head of the table. 
he got up from the best seat. And he took not the worst seat, he took the place of somebody who wasn't even invited to the table. He took the place of a servant. And then he went around and he knelt before every single one of his disciples and washed their filthy feet. And he said to them, do you understand that with us here, with people of faith, what leadership looks like is service, is a bent knee, is taking the middle seat. And we are then called as followers today to hear that message and let God integrate it in our lives because we all need it. Because by nature, we're all wired to think of ourselves. And that's not where God wants to leave us. God wants us to be transformed and to grow and to change. And so we do that. We start to take the middle seat by starting where Jesus asked his disciples to start, which is in your family. The disciples were family to each other. They lived together and they traveled together and they ate meals together. This was their little surrogate family. And so we began taking the middle seat with those who are closest to us. And this is, this is the time, y'all. Um, we're back under shelter-in-place orders. It's been five months now that we have been dealing with this in some form or the other. And all of us thought, I think all of us thought, some maybe not, but at the beginning we thought, okay, well, we're going we're gonna to do this and then we'll be through it. And then we'll be to the other side and then we'll be back to normal. And we're starting to realize that we don't know when things go back to normal. And you've all told me, so many have shared that this is just, it frays your, every bit of your patience is just frayed and um, every nerve is on end, right? And not being in control and not knowing is just so anxious and discouraging and um, it, it seems like it's always bad news. And so what that means is that we just get ugh, more and more worn down which means that the people that we've been sheltering in place with for five months now um, might be wearing more and more on our last nerve, the people that we love. And so what can happen is that you might hear yourself saying, why were you so loud? Well, I was trying to have that Zoom meeting. Can't you keep your voices down, kids? What? Or you might actually have gotten to go to work and come home and say, why are the kids still in their pajamas? Like, what's going on here? Um, or why is the house such a wreck? Or why can't we do this? Or what's wrong with you? That's a big one, right? There's a million ways that when we are um, worn out and on edge and stressed, we start getting into this, hey, it's about me, and this is not convenient for me, and so how are you going to fix it? Very selfish. And the way that we can respond with faith is then to just say, okay, Instead of demanding my rights and thinking about how this time is failing to live up to my expectations, how is it that I might make it just a little bit better for someone that I love? And I'd like you to start with those closest to you. If you are married, start with your spouse. And I want, I'm going to give you some homework. To take the middle seat, I want you to think of five things that you are going to do this week that will serve your spouse. Okay, five ways you will serve them. You could get up early and make coffee. You could send a loving text message. You could take over a chore. You could make a meal. You could, there's so many things that you could do. Think of things that your spouse would love and then serve them. Okay, honor them by serving them. And if you're watching with your spouse, then I want both of you to pick five things. And over the course of the next week, find those five ways that you're going to serve each other every day. And what you're going to see as you start to notice the way it reorients your heart to serve, the way it opens it up to, to that person that you love, to just think of how could I make this better for them instead of how could this be better for me, right? It's going to open things up, and it's going to make your relationships so much more beautiful. Those closest relationships 
when we think about how can I take the middle seat and how can I serve, that's going to bring beauty that we haven't even realized in a time of trial, right, to the person we love most. Now, um, if you have kids at home, first of all, God bless you. We are all praying for each other at this time. But what can happen as parents is we could, because we are charged by God with guiding our children down a path, we can think that the only thing we need to do is correct them. And so it becomes you're doing this wrong, and you're doing this wrong, and you're doing this wrong, and this is inconvenient. You left the dishes out, and you're not doing this. And um, that's going to discourage anybody. It's going to discourage us too. So I challenge you this week to find 30 minutes for each of your kids and to serve by just saying to the kids, hey, kids, um, we're going to have 30 minutes on whatever day it is just for us. What should we do? And if you have little kids, it might mean that you're chasing each other around the house for 30 minutes to get a good workout, or you're building towers, or you're playing puzzles. If they're older, you might be playing horse monopoly or some game that they think is really fun. If, if they're teens, um, maybe it's going to be a video game or it's going to be Sonic to get a drink during happy hour if they're doing that still. Or, you know, there's a ton of things that, that they might like to do. And that's the key is that if you're parents, you just say, I give you this 30 minutes. What should we do? And let them lead the way. And then once we've once we've served, once we've started to teach our hearts to take the middle seat daily in our families, then we can expand it a little further and say, okay, how is it I could serve in my community, in my friendship groups, at my workplace? And that can be a little bit scarier because there's this voice inside of us that says, oh, if you serve, then people will think that you're weak. So you can't do that. You have to be strong. But this is a lie. That's a lie. Jesus, the strongest person ever, was the greatest at service. Herb Kelleher, right? That day that he served the peanuts, do you think the pilots and the flight attendants and the passengers thought, oh man, he's weak? No. We admired him more and we wanted to all be like him. And so I promise you, as you serve in your workplaces, as you look for ways to serve your employees, and as you look for ways to serve in your neighborhood and in your friendship group, that is going to be such a witness, not just to your faith, but to your, to your strength as a leader. And we do all this. We serve in our families, and we serve in our neighborhoods and our workplaces so that we can finally follow Jesus' call to take that last step and serve people we don't even know and bend our knee before them, the people that we've never met, just like Jesus did, how he was always expanding the community, right? That it's not like I have an A boarding pass and you're C, you know? It's you matter to God. We both matter to God. We're both children of God. Of course, I can find a way to serve you. I can find a way to go out of my way or to sacrifice something or to give something so that this other person, so that life can be a little bit better, so that they could have a taste of what it's like to be in God's family. And the more we do that, the more we serve other people, not because they've earned it or they deserved it or they, they really had a great show and so we know that's, but we just serve them because they're, they're important to God. The more we do that, the more we're going to become like Jesus, which is the goal. The more the kingdom of God will come here on earth. Jesus said that leadership was taking the middle seat, choosing it. And so may you find blessing as you follow in the footsteps of our Savior and find all the ways that you have to take the middle seat and serve other people. Thank mm -hmm. you.
empty people filled with care, headed who knows where. On they go through private pay, living fear to fear. Laughter hides their silent cries. Only Jesus hears. People need the Lord. Friends, we have sung together, we have prayed together, we have drawn closer to God together. And as we go out, um, in whatever ways that that is, may you find the ability and the call, hear God's call to take the middle seat, to serve, to think of others. We'll see you next week.